Hi everyone. Today I'm going to tell you about a new method called the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics, or SINDI, which allows us to discover governing equations for dynamical systems purely from measurement data. And this is joint work with Josh Proctor and Nathan Kutz, and you can read more about this online at PNAS or on the archive. So dynamical systems are a great way of describing physical systems, biological systems, really anything that changes in time. Uh, and if we have access to these dynamical systems, so the set of ordinary differential equations, x dot equals f of x in some state vector x, then there's lots we can do with these dynamics. So for example, I can integrate particles through this differential equation or integrate initial conditions x at time t naught to some later time. I can integrate a grid of particles through some fluid velocity field. And there's lots of things I can do like compute coherent structures, finite time leap of exponents, uncertainty quantification. In this movie in the lower right corner, we're seeing fluid flow past uh, a rigid airfoil and we're seeing these unsteady separatrices highlighted in red, which are the time-varying analogs of stable and unstable manifolds. So lots we can do if we ha have the dynamics x dot equals f of x, but in many physical systems, like in neuroscience or in climate science, we don't always have access to exact differential equations describing the system. And so what we're going to want to do is discover these dynamics from measurement data. And that's where this sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics algorithm comes in. So we're going to illustrate this on a very, very simple toy system, the Lorentz attractor. So we have the equations here for the three variables, x, y, and z, which describe uh, the evolution of this chaotic system. And notice that in the dynamics for x dot, the only terms active are y and x. So sigma, rho, and beta are constants. In the y dot equation, we have a linear term in x, a nonlinear term in x, z, and a linear term in y. And in the z dot equations, we have a linear term in z, and then the only nonlinearity is this x, y. So in some sense, these equations are relatively simple. Out of the, out of the possible right-hand side functions, there, this has a very specific form with only a few active terms in the nonlinearity. So this will be important. So what we do is we run simulations of our system or we collect measurement data from a real experiment. We collect the data into vectors x, y, and z, so going down in time, and also x dot, y dot, and z dot. And we'll drop this condition that we need derivatives in a little bit, for, but for now let's assume we have x, y, and z in time, x dot, y dot, z dot in time as big vectors. And remember that out of all of the possible uh, right-hand side functions that these dynamics could take, this is a very specialized uh, right-hand side function that tends to be quite sparse. And when I say sparse, I mean sparse in the space of possible right-hand side functions. So now what we do is from our data x, y, and z, we construct vectors of all possible polynomial nonlinearities up to order five. So now we have uh, just ones, a vector of ones, a vector of x's, y's, and z's. We also have x squared, x, y, x, z, y squared, y, z, z squared, and so on and so forth up until z to the fifth. And what we're going to do is apply some kind of a regression to find which linear combination of these nonlinearity terms represent x dot, y dot, and z dot. Okay, pretty simple idea, but we're leveraging the fact that these dynamics out of the possible, all possible right-hand side functions, the actual dynamics for this system and for lots of systems happens to be sparse. So the way we set up this regression, we start with x dot. So I collect x dot measurements in time. And what I do is I do a sparse regression to find the fewest, uh, the linear combination of the fewest columns of this library theta of x that are needed to describe x dot. And since x dot was quite simple, it's just constant y minus constant x, this sparse regression algorithm finds that all I need are x and y uh, features in some linear combination, and I don't need any of the other terms in my nonlinear library. So sparse regression identifies the, the dynamics for the x dot equation.
And when I say sparse regression, there's lots of things you can do here. You could use the lasso algorithm from Tib Sharani. Uh, in our paper, we have an iterative sequential least squares uh, thresholding algorithm that seems to work quite well also. So for the y dot equation, we do the same thing. We look at this vector of y dot in time, and we look for what linear combination of our nonlinear feature vectors in this library theta are necessary uh, in some linear combination to reconstruct y dot. And lo and behold, you get an x term, a y term, and uh, an xz term, which is exactly what are active in this y dot equation. OK, so there's no magic going on here. I'm just saying what combination of you know, x's, y's, z's, x squareds, x, y's, x, z's, and so on and so forth are needed to represent y dot. And if I just did a least squares regression, I would get a little bit of all of these columns in the fit. And so I do this penalized, this L1 penalized uh, sparse regression. So I get good regression fit with as few uh, nonlinear right-hand side functions as possible. And similarly, you can do this for z dot, and you get the active uh, terms in this dynamics. So when you put this all together, you can find this, uh, this nonlinear model on the right in terms of these coefficients of which terms in the nonlinear uh, function space are active. And the identified system is virtually identical. It has the same structure. It has virtually the same parameters, sigma, rho, and beta. And it uh, captures the dynamics on the attractor. OK, so this is a relatively simple idea. And it takes advantage of the fact that our dynamics, if we measure in the right coordinates, uh, for example, in the Lorentz system, the right-hand side dynamics are sparse in the space of possible right-hand side dynamics, or you know, in this case, polynomials up to order 5. OK. Now, in principle, we don't want to have to measure x, y, and z and the derivatives. This seems too restrictive in lots of systems. You don't get to measure the derivatives. You just compute them from x, y, and z. And so we also have an example where we have a really noisy state measurements of the Lorentz attractor. So this is just a bunch of noise on top of the Lorentz attractor. So we have noisy measurements of x, y, and z. And for surprisingly large magnitudes of sensor noise, we're able to compute approximate derivatives using this total variation derivative, uh, or TV diff. This is total variation regularized derivative based on the total variation regularization um, below. And even with tremendously noisy data and only having measurements of x, y, and z, we're still able to get very good structure identification with Cindy and uh, quite accurate representation of the, the Lorentz attractor and, and dynamics on the attractor. So pretty cool that you don't actually need to measure derivatives. You can have really noisy state measurements. Uh, and you can use this total regularization, total variation regularized derivative in addition with some kind of a sparse regression. And both of these algorithms are quite robust numerically, and so they give us great results even for, for noisy data. Okay. So now I want to move on to a more complicated and a more interesting example problem. Uh, and so this is the example of fluid flow past uh, a stationary cylinder inducing vortex shedding. Uh, and this is, this is a benchmark problem in fluid dynamics. And when we realize that the Cindy algorithm can predict a good nonlinear low order model for this system, we started to get really excited because this is actually um, pretty close to some research problems in uh, fluid dynamics. So, there's a nice bit of history here, um, and this is kind of a rough sketch. There's more details, but uh, I want to paint this picture that finding a low order model for the cylinder, for vortex shedding past a cylinder, was not a simple task. It took decades of very bright people working very hard to develop new theories. Um, so discovering these dynamics would be quite, quite interesting. So um, Ruel and Talkins in 1971 proposed a hop bifurcation route to turbulence, where you have a fluid system undergoing sequential hop bifurcations. And at some point, after a number of these hop bifurcations, the system becomes uh, chaotic and turbulent. In fact, this was proposed earlier by Hopf uh, himself and also by Landau. Um, but the, the basic idea is that there's this, I this idea that hop bifurcations might uh, be a route to turbulence and chaos. Uh, 
15 years after Ruel and Hawkins, Zabib and Jackson and others independently numerically verified that in the cylinder wake example, as we increase the Reynolds number, or equivalently the oncoming flow velocity, as we speed up the flow past the cylinder, at some critical Reynolds number, around 47, the system goes through a hop bifurcation, after which you get periodic laminar vortex shedding. So about 15 years after this Ruel Talkins paper, there was numerical verification that a hop bifurcation actually exists in fluid systems, which is great, very interesting. Uh, but at the same time, this started getting, uh, this, this created a real paradox of sorts in that the hop normal form or the, the form of the nonlinearity required to get a hop bifurcation are cubic, right? There's cubic terms in a hop normal form. Whereas we know that Navier Stokes systems have at most quadratic nonlinearity due to the convection terms. So there is this paradox. How do I capture a third order hop bifurcation phenomenon with a fluid system that has quadratic nonlinearities in the physics? Okay, so 15 years it took to, to find this Hopf bifurcation, and it took 15 years later, um, 15 more years, to find a solution to this, this seeming paradox of how you can get a Hopf bifurcation with a quadratic uh, system of quadratic nonlinearities. And so this was uh, discovered by Noack et al. in JFM in 2003. And the idea here is that you can have a separation of time scales argument. So I can have fast directions in the flow and slow directions in the flow. So this z variable here is a fast variable in the, the z direction between some unstable fixed point and the mean flow of my vortex shedding. And this z variable rapidly adheres onto this slow parabolic manifold given by x squared y squared, uh, where x and y are the magnitude of vortex shedding. And once z rapidly kind of pulls onto this slow manifold, then it just wraps and wraps and wraps until it gets periodic vortex shedding in x and y. Okay, so notice in x dot, y dot, and z dot, there's nothing but quadratic nonlinearities. But this system does undergo a hop bifurcation uh, and, and exhibits vortex shedding. So this is a beautiful theory, uh, roughly 30 years progression of very, very um, good work finding these hop bifurcations and explaining how you can get them with quadratic nonlinearities. Very interesting. So we thought this would be a great test system for our Cindy algorithm. So now what we're going to do is we collect the exact same data, just data from a simulation of vortex shedding. I do some dimensionality reduction, like proper orthogonal decomposition, to find the modes that describe vortex shedding, uh, and also this shift mode from the unstable equilibrium to the mean flow. And I plug in those, those coefficients, those three uh, time series of POD mode 1 and 2 and shift mode into the Cindy algorithm. And what's really amazing is that we identify a system that has structurally the same form uh, it only has quadratic nonlinearities. There is this slow parabolic manifold, and it captures uh, this spiral onto vortex shedding. So very interesting that the Cindy algorithm, if you feed it purely data from a numerical simulation, will back out the right, uh, the right form of the dynamics purely with, it'll discover these quadratic nonlinearities and this fast, slow time scale separation. So this got us really excited that maybe we can actually solve real problems uh, with this algorithm. So it's really important to note at this point that if I just take measurements of my system on the slow manifold, so let's say I start somewhere on the slow manifold and I watch the system evolve onto vortex shedding, the Cindy algorithm incorrectly identifies cubic nonlinearities. And so what I actually have to do is I have to kick my system off the attractor. So for example, I start at the mean flow, the system falls down and then winds back up again. Or maybe I start out here, the system goes to the slow manifold and winds back down. But the, the moral of the story is to actually identify the correct quadratic nonlinearities for this problem, we have to kick the system off of the attractor. And this is in general a very important strategy when you're identifying nonlinear dynamics of a system that has uh, some sort of attractor is it's really important to kick off the attractor to see how the system falls back on. Without that, we wouldn't be able to identify the correct uh, normal form here. And so this got us thinking that 
In addition to identifying uh, nonlinear dynamical systems at a particular value of a parameter, like the Reynolds number, we can actually do parameterized dynamics essentially for free. Okay, so I can look at a system x dot equals f of x and a set of parameters mu, where mu dot are fixed, they're zero. And so here we are um, looking at the logistic map. So I sample the logistic map at 10 parameter values or 10 mu values in these uh, light blue locations. I use that as the training data. So now instead of just constructing columns of x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, x to the fifth, I also treat mu as a feature vector. So I have mu x, mu x, x squared, mu x squared, and so on and so forth. I have all of the combinations, all of the polynomial combinations of mu and x, and I do the same sparse regression and identify not only the dynamics at one parameter value, but I actually get the parameterized dynamics. And so using these 10 training values, we get a parameterized model that you can then evaluate at all parameters, uh, and you generalize beautifully into this uh, logistic map. Um, kind of bifurcation diagram that we're used to seeing. You can also do this on the Hopf normal form, um, similar to the vortex shedding example, except now we're actually sweeping through a number of parameters in the Hopf normal form and identifying the parameterized system. So very cool, you can include parameters mu, you can include time as a vector, so I can have, or maybe sine of time, or time squared, or time x, so I can have um, time varying dynamical systems. I can also include forcing, external forcing from, uh, let's say I'm, I'm doing a climate simulation and I've got CO2 forcing. I can include that as a, a feature vector or control forcing like some, some state feedback. Okay, so a couple of other neat things I wanna tell you. So the Cindy algorithm is great. Uh, it's based on simple sparse regression. So it's very extensible, uh, very powerful, lots of things you can do with it. And so one of those things I'm going to tell you about are how you use Cindy and time delay coordinates. Okay, so in our original Lorentz system, and I get this question a lot, and it's a great question, what if I only had access to some subset of these primitive uh, measurement variables? Instead of x, y, and z, what if I just had access to x? Okay, and we're not the first people to think about this. Lots and lots of people think about this problem where I have some complicated system, some complicated chaotic system, and I have limited measurements. Okay, so maybe just X in the Lorentz system. What do I do uh, and will Cindy still work? So the short answer is yes, Cindy still works. And what we end up doing in this case is we take our time series of our measurement X and we build up a Hankel matrix where we essentially take x and we take shifted copies of x, so x1 to xp, x2 to xp plus 1, x3 to xp plus 2, and so on. So these are time series. I, I, I cut out the first p pieces of x, and I, that's my first row. Then I take 2 to p plus 1, that's my second row, and so on and so forth. So I shift and stack my single measurement in time into this Hankel matrix H. And if I take the singular value decomposition of this Hankel matrix, I essentially get a set of eigen delay coordinates or eigen time series that best represent this particular time series X. And so if I use the, the columns of V as a new set of generalized coordinates, we can beautifully reconstruct um, a topologically equivalent attractor. This is uh, standard kind of Tawkins embedding theory here, that I can get uh, an embedding in these time delay coordinates with a single measurement that is topologically uh, equivalent to the original Lorentz attractor. Very cool. And if I take those uh, three measurements, so this is the first column of V, the second column of V, uh, first column, third column, second column, third column. So I'm taking the first three eigen time series from the SVD of this Hankel matrix. I plug those into the Cindy algorithm and I get a sparse model that very, very nicely reconstructs the attractor. So on the bottom, we're actually seeing the Cindy model with the same initial condition and it traces out the same dynamics on this um, time delay embedded attractor. Very cool, you can do time delay uh, with Cindy if you have limited measurements.
Now, it's also interesting to note people, <coughs> of course, have been looking at these time delay systems for decades. Um, Tolkien's embedding theory really uh, got everybody excited about this. And I found this really nice um, visualization of the same basic Lorentz system in these same eigen time delay coordinates in Broomhead and King from 1986. So people have been looking at these uh, SVDs or singular value decompositions of the Hankel matrix in the context of singular spectrum analysis, SSA in climate science, or the Eigen system realization algorithm, ERA, in control theory and system identification. But now we can do this for nonlinear dynamical systems, and we actually get a nonlinear model out on those time delay coordinates. Very cool. So the last thing I want to show you is Cindy with control. So lots of times uh, your dynamical system x dot equals f of x is not just evolving in its natural state, but it's being externally forced, either through some exogenous disturbance or forcing signal, or through some active feedback control. Maybe I'm modifying the system deliberately. And so I have this plus g of u term here. Okay, and what this g of u allows me to do, and this g of u could be um, you know, in x dot, y dot, or z dot, or it could enter in all three. I just picked the first x dot equation. What this g of u does is it allows me to have this control enter possibly non-linearly. So g of u could be u cubed, or u to the fourth, or sine of u. And u can be a non-linear function itself. In this case, I chose a state feedback control, 26 minus x plus some white noise disturbance. But it could be some exogenous you know, uh, external forcing or state feedback, and it can enter non-linearly. So with uh, the Cindy algorithm, again, if I build a feature library of possible nonlinearities that are a function of x, y, z, and u now, let's say I measure u, then I can discover these dynamical systems from measurement data. Okay, so I can discover the dynamical system plus forcing. Basically, I use the same code. I just treat x, y, z, and u. Uh, as my possible feature um, features that I'm taking combinations of. So here's an example where we do Cindy with control. So from time 0 to 20, we have a training set of data that's being controlled. I measure x, y, and z, and u. And I learn my Cindy model. I learn this, this sparse nonlinear model with control. And then at time 20, what happens is I switch from one control protocol to another. Okay, so the original Cindy algorithm in yellow fails miserably when I turn on a different control law because it didn't, original Cindy didn't know there was external forcing or feedback control, but the new Cindy with control uh, in light blue perfectly matches the new test data because it learned the structure of the dynamics, how the control enters, and so if I give a different U, a different protocol for how to control U, then Cindy with control can track perfectly uh, the actual uh, validation data. So it's very cool that you can identify not only the nonlinear dynamical system, but you can also disambiguate the effect of control from the underlying dynamics and train a system so that if you change your control policy, you can, you can capture it with this model. Okay, um, so just to summarize, we have lots of data. We want dynamics. There's lots of cool things we can do when we have dynamics uh, or dynamical systems. And so a general procedure to go from data to dynamics in this CINDY or sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics frameworks, first we measure. We measure what we have access to. In the Lorentz system, we try to measure x, y, and z. If we only measure x, we build time delay coordinates, but we measure. Um, then we find some some basis where we can represent the possible nonlinear dynamics that, that explain those measurements. So in the case of Lorentz, I build a library of x, y, and z, and also all of the other polynomial nonlinearities up to z to the fifth. So I, I build some representation for those dynamics. And then I use sparse regression, or lasso type, type algorithms, to find the fewest of those nonlinear features that are required to explain the measurements and I get a sparse dynamical system purely from measurement data. Okay, so some of the issues that crop up, some other questions I get a lot are, well, how do you know you measured the right things? Um, this is a pretty important question. There's lots of 
interesting ways of, of tackling that. So for example, the time delay uh, coordinate perspective gives you some powerful tools to figure out, am I measuring enough variables? Um, are two variables that I'm measuring correlated? Do they give me new information? There's lots of, of theory of, am I measuring the right thing in the dynamical system? But maybe a more uh, difficult question is, how do I know that I'm using the right nonlinear basis to represent my dynamics, right? Maybe, maybe polynomial nonlinearities aren't going to work for my system. Maybe I need sines and cosines. Maybe I need Bessel's functions. Maybe I need rational functions. And this is an excellent point. Um, so typically, depending on the physics of the system, you have some idea, or you should have some idea of what are good measurements. And you should have some idea of functions that might be important to represent your dynamics. So for example, if I'm doing Navier-Stokes equations for fluids, I know that I have quadratic nonlinearities. Um, other systems have different nonlinearities. So it gives you some guidance on how to measure and how to build uh, possible candidate nonlinear function bases. But in general, uh, we do recommend trying, you know, try different, different bases. Try polynomials, try trigonometric, try other bases. Um, and we do have new methods to generalize to rational functions, to trigonometric functions, uh, and those will be online soon. And the regression is perhaps the easiest step. We have lots of great tools numerically uh, that are very robust, very stable for regression. So once you have good measurements and a good representation, a possible good representation of the dynamics, finding the active terms, the active nonlinearities uh, is in some sense the easy part. Okay, uh, so with that, I will conclude. You can read more again uh, in PNAS. Thank you very much.